Hi, everybody. Welcome to what number podcast is it? I don't 33, know man. I'm at what number? 33. 33. Welcome to podcast number 33 of the Electric Tale podcast. Now, one of the subject, I mean, this is only part of what we're going to talk about, probably, but one of the things I haven't um, covered, I think, in the podcast, although it's a big part of my life, is Palestine and my support for uh, Palestinian rights. And I am one of those. Uh, elderly Jews who um, supports Palestine, Palestinian rights, and is much excoriated for it. There's me, Miriam Margolis, uh, Michael Rosen. I'm keeping a bit quieter, but nevertheless, still vocal from time to time. Mike Lee. I think that's about it, really. But um, uh, and the countless uh, Labour Party members who've been um, yes, and the countless you know, yeah, out, Jewish Labour Party members who've been expelled. Yeah. For their support for Palestine and for signing uh, petitions five years ago for organisations that weren't banned at the time but are now banned, and like Stephen Marks, who've been expelled. Uh, what purge? Purge? What purge? <laughs> In Davos at the moment, Keir Starmer waiting for uh, your orders from the, uh, the world. Uh, Capitalism. Oh my God! And and it's people often highlight how it's such a contradiction to call yourself left wing and yet be a supporter of Israel because yeah yeah I think it's two... um, I think that uh, and then obviously we think that um, you know that one of the, in the main reason one of the reasons certainly for, for Jeremy Corbyn's uh, ejection was yeah. his, uh, his anti colonialist. Uh, Positioning, uh, you know, and his, uh, his his support for Palestinian rights in general. Did you see that was there was that cartoon in private? I ah, did you you sent it to me, didn't you? Did I you did. send it to me? Oh, somebody sent it to me. I thought must it be you. another Talal. Oh no, it was John. That no, was John Kelly. There's a cartoon in private. I which says I don't quite understand it. It's on page twenty for anybody who current issue <laughs> wants to look at it, and it says there's a bloke saying I bought an Alexi, and then there's a giant my head on his table for some reason. And my my head is saying, I hate Keir Starmer, me. So obviously my... <laughs> ah, so what? Another Alexa, Alexi joke? I think it must be an Alexa, Alexi joke. Yeah, I, I believe so. The Viz did it first. We've discussed yeah. the Viz one. Or, or did we do that on the podcast or in the live show? You know, I, I think... Because we did it at the Cartoon Museum. I brought the yeah. Viz comic yeah. with me. And we did a live reading of the Viz yeah. Ask Alexi comic strip. But that is part of the section that got cut out well you remember the mic stopped working and oh, there was like right. a 10 minute oh, okay. chunk missing from the live show and i was really upset because that um, yeah well, well, we, just we, to just to I, point and remind everybody it was from a copy of viz and there's a well, well it, there's a well, you, you just we're well, sorry man we'll get to you yeah, <laughs> we, we talking, have a guest waiting in the wings. we have a guest but i'm just talking about <laughs> me. That's copy- right. all right we're out of time uh thanks <laughs> <Ram. Thanks for laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a it's like years ago i just years and years ago i um i was friendly with or my agent was friendly with the producers of uh the letterman show uh-huh and um every, every, we went and saw the recording i think on a monday the letterman show and the guest was going to be i think it was ellen DeGeneres, and they said oh we don't have time for ellen DeGeneres tonight but um uh, we'll have her on tomorrow. And then I noticed on the Tuesday show, oh, we don't have time for Ellen DeGeneres. And she never got on. She constantly got bumped. Uh, 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 yeah, because at that time she wasn't uh, a big star. Although she became a big star later. But that <laughs> was so rude. Uh, sort of uh, every night on the Letman show, Ellen DeGeneres got bumped. So Imran's going to be like this. He's never going to. He's never going to get to say anything. I mean, then we're going to be out of time. And uh... <laughs> 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 so yeah, we'll, and we'll have you back really soon, Imran. <laughs> Looking yeah. forward to it. <laughs> yeah. We're on a uh, tight schedule. Killjoy is using the studio after us, so yeah, we do yeah, have to be yeah. out at a certain time. Where we're, so anyway, yes, the Alexa joke. Do you want to describe it? Just will. Uh, Lee Healy is the artist, and Barney Farmer is the writer. They do John yeah. Baker's in the Viz and all that. Yeah. So this is a uh, Ask Alexi. So um, there's a slob on the sofa drinking a beer, 
He goes, uh, Alexi, play Get Lucky by Daft Punk. Then you cut to the second picture, which is me in my sort of 19 iterations of the sort of the grey suit and the stripy tie, which I've just thrown out, I see. And I say, Alexi, 1980s, Alexi says, Daft Punk, Daft Punk. I knew Daft Punk when they were a Cornish folk trio, Jethro, Adj and Arthur. And he starts dancing in the Hello John Got New Motor style. He says, Sea shanties about life in the tin mines. Yo ho ho, yo ho ho. 15 men in a pit full of ore. Weddings, birthdays, funerals, and Masonic discotheques. Arthur fucked off to Nicaragua, led the first and only West Country CIA death squad. And then Alexi, while he's doing, while he's dancing about, he's, put, he's getting a, a CD out the rack. He puts the CD in, in the, the CD. player. And he stands in the corner while the CD plays. I'm, I'm up all night to get, get lucky. lucky. I'm up all, all night, night to, get, to lucky. get lucky. And then the guy on the sofa is He's happily, happily nodding smiling. away to the music. So that's the that's the Alexa joke in Viz. Now this one in Private Eye is similar. I will just uh, somebody WhatsApp it to me. It's on page twenty of the latest copy of Private Eye, and it says. Very crudely, he says, I, a man in the jumper in his kitchen saying, I bought an Alexi, and then he's, yeah, my giant head on the table. And it says, I fucking hate Keir Starmer, me. That's so there we are. Anyway, so that's that. So if my... any of you listeners out there have seen any other iterations of Alexi in comic yeah. strips, um, you know, maybe Marvel have... There was years ago... Um, I think at the start of my career, somebody had somebody sent there was an there was an advert for I think it was for alarms or something and burglar alarms and there was a a drawing of some villains stealing uh, stuff from a warehouse and one of them was clearly you know the the the, the illustrator had been looking for reference material and had come a kind of photo of me wearing a little beanie hat and it was oh, clearly shit. me. Uh, but I, I did. I mean, I you know I don't know whether it was. That's I did not think about it in the end, but uh, <laughs> I featured in an ad for uh, alarms. Yeah, and we know you, you don't do ads. Yes, our guest in the our week. guest. So you were talking Dave. about Palestine, and that was for a reason. Yeah, right? that was. That's why I was. Uh, yeah, that's why I, an hour and a half ago I was talking about Palestine. <laughs> and my guest is Imran Yusuf, a comedian. And the last time we met was we were doing a, a, a benefit for Palestine, which was on a boat. Uh, in um, Maud on the Thames. And, uh, well, I mean, just, uh, I think, Imran, we're also going to use this opportunity because it's, I think it's, it's six years since, uh, it's nearly six years since Jamie Hardy's death. And uh, Imran went on a, a delegation to the West Bank with uh, the occupied Palestinian territories with Jeremy. And oh, so it wow. gives us a chance to talk about uh, Jeremy and his... Uh, uh, just is is all around a great good guyness and also but also his support for Palestinian rights and Imran so t- uh, Imran tell us a little bit about yourself oh, uh, yes <laughs> so hello <laughs> Sorry, after all uh, I'm time. Imran Yusuf a uh, comedian and as you uh, as you said um, I did go out to the West Bank with Jeremy Hardy in January 2017 with medical aid for Palestinians and we went there to look at the various projects that map have um, across the West Bank we were in Ramallah Jerusalem Jordan Valley uh, Bethlehem um, Hebron and we just went and ch- uh, checked out you know what map fund and what they do an interesting thing about map is that it's a British charity and it is actually supported by both Britain and and well, it's approved by the Israeli government for them to operate because obviously you need to have some form of approval. So obviously they've got to be very mindful of what they say and what they're involved in. Um, I don't work for them. Um, I just support map so I can say whatever I want and <laughs> I'm a comedian too. Yeah, so well, me too. I, I mean, I, I've, I think I've actually supported uh, map since it's more or less since its inception, which oh, wow. uh, was, uh, yeah, I think I'm a, I think I'm OG as far as, uh, as map mm-hmm. goes. And they're, a, they're, a, they're a wonderful organization, which, uh, you know, have to battle against tremendous um, odds. Uh, mm. And we will have, we will have Alice Watts, one is a, a fundraiser for map and uh, maybe the director on at a later date, uh, Possibly after that, I think they're just on their way out to uh, the West Bank. So when they get back, they will um, also. Would you ever go? I um, 
Well, I think there's several things that uh, prevent me from going. One, I'm not entirely sure that I would get in because they are, you know, I think anybody uh, prominent can often be turned back at the uh, mm. the gates, you know, you know, can turn back at Tel Aviv or if you try and get across the Allenbury Bridge, the Israelis will turn you back. I've also got a slightly niggling 5% worry that, you know, as, as Jews get older, some of them turn Zionistical. You know, they suddenly go all like... You might hear oh, the calling of the homeland. I, I, I'm just a bit worried that I might flip, you know, if I went out there. It happened to my, I mean, my best friend, Harry, went, you know, just went fucking bonkers. In, and it was a problem between us, really. But, you know, in later life, they start thinking about mortality and they go all kind of, they go all kind of, uh, yeah, Zionist. Plus... Uh, Young women with M4 carbines, I might um, develop an unhealthy fixation on uh, <laughs> Shit. Those, those, those members of the Israeli Defense Force. That'd be all like, oh, hello. Oh, I like your M4, 5.56 oh, ammunition. God. You know, I'm a bit worried about that. That's a, that's a minor worry, but I... I I, so I've never been. I mean, they've invited me, and it's it's partly just. Ca- I I also think it would, in many ways, it would be so upsetting to to go. I, I'm I'm probably being a coward about it, really. But I so um so one cowardice. Two, I think they might turn me back anyway. And three, a small worry that I'll I'll go all kind of he brave <laughs> <laughs> and horny for gun. Yeah, and only for um, <laughs> young women with their uh, M4 or the Israeli Tavor. Did you have any of those experiences, Imran, when you went to the West Bank? <laughs> uh, well, I've been. <clears throat> well, I remember I've been twice. So the first time I went to uh, Jerusalem, I, I went on pilgrimage in 2006, and I wanted to go to Jerusalem first, and then go on to Mecca and Medina, and I crossed the Allenby Bridge uh, into Jordan in order to then get the corresponding flight uh, to Saudi. And I remember just all these young Israeli, like Israeli women in, you know, in their military uniforms and machine guns. And yet it's, 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 it's an odd sight. It's quite an alluringly odd sight. But I was there in pilgrimage mode. So, you know, my, my head was down uh, trying to focus on that. And then after, you know, I spent about five and a half, maybe six weeks in the Middle East back in 2006 and I went you know what I'm never coming back here again like I like I've had enough like I've seen it I've done it um I don't like it because of you know especially after about after a couple of weeks in Jerusalem I just thought I, I have to leave here like uh, the, the, you can just attention is pal- palpable it's it's not a pleasant place to, it wasn't a place to be and also I was there when um Hezbollah were firing rockets into into Israel so it was that uh, during that um conflict in 2006 so you know tensions were a little bit higher I, I could never get into the old city on a friday for friday prayers uh they stopped anybody under the age of 40 going to pray at uh al-aqsa so i never got to do friday prayers there i had to go elsewhere and um and i remember i'll never go back and then at the end of 2016 map called me and go we'd like to send you out uh on this project i went no i'm not going back there like i don't like it and i'm not doing it and they're like we're also sending Jeremy Hardy. And I was like, I gotta go now. I gotta, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta go. This is an important thing now. I get and it was bless him. It was the last trip he made out of the country, and that was with me, was to make that film for Medical Aid for Palestinians, which you can all watch. It's on YouTube. Yeah, it's an amazing film. Isn't it? yeah. So uh, well, it was we only showed, you know, the film isn't that long, and we only showed so much. There were things in there that, you know, we saw and covered that we didn't put into the film, mm-hmm. such as, you know, walking where where there's a security fence between where Israelis live and where Palestinians live, there were used, you know, gas shells and bullets that had obviously been used on Palestinians just left on the ground. And I, I picked them up. I took pictures with them. But obviously, you, you know, I'm not putting that in my luggage and bringing it back home as a souvenir. And it, talking to Palestinians, th- there were some personal conversations that we had with Palestinians where you're like, and you understand the impact that it's made in their lives, how it's reduced them to being less than second class citizens, reduced them to being prisoners in their own land. And it's horrific because I realize just how much freedom I have and how much I take it for granted and how and what a helpless position these Palestinians are in. 
and the, and then further juxtaposed with the fact that trying to have this conversation where we are is is very difficult for some comedians are co courageous enough to step forward and say things and it will cost you it will cost you things in your career mm -hmm. and it's but you know it's a funny thing if it's a comedian you can say what you want but you've got to watch what you say when you criticize israel because so, you know you may not get certain you just basically you will get blacklisted and we know this as a fact that there are donors to palestinian charities who are very prominent who do not um who cannot uh, give you know give their name in support to a Palestinian charity because it will cost them in their career. These these are actors, and mm, so yeah. this is what I've been told firsthand, uh, and and that's a really horrible place to be in. That this is a human rights, a, a massive human rights issue. There are consequences for speaking up for the human rights of Palestinians, and it's massively disgusting. And maybe mm -hmm. in the future we will look back at this a lot of people look back at this and go, oh my god they they it was really difficult for them to talk about palestinians only the few people did and it's important what we're doing now because you know it doesn't matter what background you're from human rights are human rights yes i agree you're very eloquently put yeah you can feel that you know i everyone's getting really tired of it you know there's this yeah. we're watching human rights violations being perpetrated on palestinians and and at the same time being dissuaded from talking about it the, i think public consciousness this is the, this is the upside of the interconnected social media world that we live in is that public consciousness at a point we just go no we, we've had enough this is not cool in the same way i think you mm. know the world sided with uh black south africans when apartheid was running rampant in south africa and yeah. you know ruining the quality of lives and the dignity of a people who had been there for so long who had been there from the start and the same thing will happen with Israel and Palestine. And Hopefully. in this, being in this space has also made me realize that it's very important for us to be very specific with our language and to understand there are yeah. lots of Israelis and lots of uh, Jewish people who support human rights, who support Palestinian rights. And we need to understand that we have to build bridges where we can between all the various communities involved here, particularly Israelis, mm. uh, Jews, Muslims, Palestinians, the larger Arab world. There are bridges to be build, built here, bridges of peace and understanding. And we're trying to do that whilst at the same time coming from, you know, where, where, there, where there are extremists on either side, but the upper hand does belong to Israel because it has the military power and, you know, the, 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 the support of the British and American governments who, who allow it to perpetrate the crimes that it does against Palestinians. Hmm. Yeah. Again, beautifully put. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about how you know what your your background is, and uh, you know how you became a, got to comedy? And I mean, you're actually an observant Muslim, is that? Is uh, that what I deduce from your? Uh, what it depends you're on who you ask. Going on the I, Hajj. I just, it, <laughs> well, well, yeah, I, I, I'm a, I've I've grown up in the Muslim tradition. Uh, I am a Muslim, however, but when I say that, it depends on how you know how anyone wants to define it. In some people's eyes, oh, I'm not Muslim. No way am I Muslim enough. In some people's eyes, oh wow, he's pretty full on. I'll give you yeah. an example. So. My background, just to kind of bring, give it to you concisely, ethnically I'm Indian, but I was born in East Africa, in Kenya. My family, are for, we are the Indians that ended up in East Africa after um, after British colonial exploits in India. Uh, my family then came here to the UK uh, fleeing Uganda because they were kicked out by Idi Amin. Uh, my mum became pregnant with me later, and so she went back to Kenya, gave birth to me there. And so I was raised here and I've been naturalized. I'm a naturalized British citizen now. I, I have a certificate. Um, I think I got it when I was about 12. And um, Congrats, man. Yeah, thank you. Finally, <laughs> I've got a license to be here. Well, that, that's what it is. And as we've seen, you know, it can quite easily be taken away if I don't jump through all the hoops. Yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah, now I'm a, a comedian. And the reason I went on that pilgrimage uh, in 2006 is that I started to, when you grow up in a religious culture, a religious tradition, you just kind of, you go with the flow. You do as you're told and you go with it. This is your identity. Hmm. And I really started to question it and go, well, why do we believe what we believe? Why do we practice what we practice? Why are there so many different various forms uh, and, and schools of thought within any one religion? And I started to really question things. And I thought, well, if I really believe in this, then surely I should read my holy book. You can't just walk around going, I belong to this religious group and know nothing about it no, hmm. and, and not be uh competent in the subject 
Mm. So uh, I was like, right, I need to read the Quran cover to cover in a language that I understand. I can't just sit around here chanting Arabic all day because I don't speak Arabic. I can recite it when I yeah. pray, but I don't understand. I can't speak it as a language. So I started reading the Quran. I was like, you know what? I need to go on a pilgrimage. I need to make this journey and really understand the depths of what it means to have faith and what my faith is. If or, or you know, or am I just following other people? And so that you know, I booked the tickets to fly to a Ben Gurion Airport, uh, Tel Aviv, um, and just before I flew out, Hezbollah firing rockets into Israel. It kicks off. I've turned up and I'm you know hauled into into questioning. But the funny thing is. Before I left, months before I left, I wrote to the Home Office. I wrote to the Israeli Embassy, going, "My name's Imran Youssef. I'm making this trip. You're probably going to want to talk to me. Here's my <laughs> contact details." And none of them replied to me except just before I left Heathrow. Uh, two plain clothes like police officers just went, "Hello there. You know, can we ask you some questions?" I was like, "Yeah, man. I, I understand what this looks like, and I know you're going to want to question me. So let's let's do this." And they were really polite. Uh, they just asked me, you know, what, why I'm making this journey, what's going on. I go, look, I'm going on pilgrimage. I know this is an ideal time with what's going on, but this is important to me. And I just want to go. Here are my contact details. You can contact me anytime I'm on this trip. They they were really cool. They were really polite. And then they let me get my flight. When I get to the other end, I get hauled up into questionings there. Weirdly enough, the Israeli uh, Ministry of Defense people who questioned me were really polite, really welcoming you know, uh, not at all hostile in the way that I've sometimes experienced in America. And um, and then I was on on my way and on that trip. And I spent a lot of time in Al-Aqsa. I was in, in, not only was I at the Dome of the Rock, I was under it praying every day and reading the Quran. Um, and it was, it was a difficult journey. It's a lot, it was a lot of soul searching. And then went on to Mecca and Medina. And um, I, I learned a lot. It was a ma it was a huge point in my life where I really learned a lot about myself, and I and I learned a lot about when we say that we are this part of this religious group or we that we have faith. What does that really mean? Are you just saying it because you want to fit in, or are you saying it because you see the value in this religious in this particular religious tradition and its particular stories? So I learned a lot from that, and then I came back and then just kind of got on with life. I kind of took took my foot off the gas on religious introspection and went back to work uh, for a bit. Um, and then, you know, kind of grew up, life happens. Mm. Life doesn't kind of unfold perfectly for everybody. And um, then went on that second trip of 2017. And what's really stuck out to me is that we've, we're only, we've only got so much time in this world. And in, whilst I'm here, I want to do some good because I've been the recipient of other people's kindness. And I want to give my kindness to those who can't even are not even allowed to defend themselves, uh, particularly Palestinians, because talking about Palestine, criticizing Israel is a difficult thing to do. Fortunately, I'm a stand up comedian and I'm handsome and charming. So <laughs> I know how to do it in a way to say what needs to be said, the difficult things that need to be said. In, in criticizing the state of Israel and the crimes that it commits against Palestinians, but at the same time, building bridges with the Jewish and Israeli communities who want to build these bridges, who want to build a better world, who don't want to make it one dimensional where, you know, mm. that there is there is a Pharaoh and that there are and that there are slaves and we can build that together. It's um. So I know I've gone on here a bit. I just want to tell you quickly. That's all right. Um, I went. So an Israeli comedian, her name's Noam Shuster Eliassi. She um, she came over to the UK. She's so I hope I say this correctly. She's she was raised in a place called Neev Shalom in uh, Israel, which is a place where Arabs and Israelis are kind of socially engineered to get along. So she speaks Arabic uh, and, um, you know, she's got lots of Arab friends. And so this is a, a great thing. And so she's her background. If I, if I hope I get this right, I think her mum's like Iranian Jewish. And her father's as Ashkenazi uh, Jewish, and mm -hmm. they're all like very, you know, hippies, progressive. They want to make the world a better place. And so she went on TV and she criticised the Abraham Accords, and she became and it went viral, and she became qu quite famous. Um, and then she came over to the UK and she played at JW3, the big Jewish cultural centre in Finchley, in Finchley Road. Mm -hmm. And I remember she came, and it was on the same day the Queen died, and just before she went on stage. We all got a notification that the Queen had passed away five minutes before she was due on stage. And she came on stage. <laughs> and she, yeah. And she came on stage and she gave it, she did a prayer in Hebrew for the Queen. 
Right. Uh, and then she did uh then she did her show and told us all about herself and what she does and uh you know she's turned down you know she doesn't uh d- she's turned down uh being in the IDF she's turned down being uh minish uh, you know being a spy or and all of this kind of stuff because she cares about making the world a better place and building bridges with Palestinians uh, <coughs> as as herself as an Isra- you know a jewish israeli so that's fascinating to see and i want people to know about her and to mm-hmm. see about her particularly people in the broader muslim community in the uk who may not have any interactions with with jews or israelis because a weird i think in this country if you live in london you're you're quite lucky but there are parts of this country other parts of this nation in which there are there are enclaves of 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 people who don't interact with people outside of their own background and that's a recipe for disaster yeah. uh, especially in the modern world like but, healing, oh. <laughs> like healing. <laughs> um i think growing up in london has been a blessing in my life because i've always been surrounded by every culture uh religion that you can think of and it's uh and i think because of that it's helped me become the person that i am is that Let's work together, make the world a better place. It's a difficult conversation to have. There are lots of difficult areas that we have to traverse. But if we're committed to doing it together, we can make the world a better place. So the next generation of kids who come through don't have to live one of, in, in a world of fear and lack and suspicion of other mm. people. Hey, some of the most difficult connections I, I have tried to make are with other Arabs and, and Muslims in my life. Like that's some of the most difficult uh times like uh, trying to because especially because they grew up in this bubble like you said sometimes you know i don't want to generalize but yes it happens a lot man that they just don't fathom a world a, a, a life a, a lifestyle or a world outside of their way of of being and it's it can be really difficult to uh convince people to open up and be mm. more welcoming it's, to uh, new uh, ideas i'm lucky so i grew up in hackney first in hackney downs first eight years of my life and so that was a multicultural melting pot back in the 80s. Mm. And I benefit from that. And I quite um, so this is the very first time I learned anything about Jewish people was um, from my mum. So what happened? I was I think maybe I was about six years old and I was in school and I found a book in the school library about Islam. Right. And I picked it up and I was like, oh, right, this is about my religion. This is about who I am. And so I took the book and I told the teachers, you know, I'd like to take this book home. You know, you could take books home from school. So I don't know if they, yeah, um, yeah, they still do that, right? I'm pretty yeah. sure they still do that. So I took this book home uh, and, you know, the, te- the the school didn't call prevent. None of that was happening. Uh, th- these were much better times in the 80s. And I took it home and my parents were really proud. My mum was really proud that I've identified what my religion is. And I understand this is about me. I took it home and it was just, it was a very, you know, it was a kid's, it's, uh, it was a very kind of, this is what Islam is. This is where it's come from. This is what Muslims believe. And I remember my mum distinctly telling me this story. She goes, she said, uh, the Jews are like us, right? They're like us Muslims because they believe in Moses and we also believe in Moses. And so that's why we're allowed to eat their food, whatever their f- food. And I went, all oh, right. And so oh. I grew up believing that Jews were just another type of Muslim, effectively. right? <laughs> well, and effectively, really, it is. It's, yeah. mono, it's very strict monotheism. That's what it's about. And it's about the creed of Abraham. And and so that's what I thought. I didn't know about Israel, Palestine. I didn't know about any of that. I just thought Jews are just other types of Muslims, and that's cool. Um, and that's how I grew up, and that's uh, that, that's a story I had in my head. And then as I became an adult, and you start to learn about Israel and Palestine, and just uh, and that whole that whole massive story, yeah. it then starts to bring a different dimension to this story. And I'm like, right, well, I have to learn about this. And what I'm very fortunate about is that I, in this country, in Britain, I've been able to engage the Jewish community so easily, right? I've been able to, you know, I know Rabbi uh, Laura Yana Klausner of the Reform Synagogue, where she was the senior rabbi. I think she's doing something else now. Um, I've been able to, I, I know Ashley Blaker, who's an Orthodox Jewish comedian. Yes, I mean, I, I, we could talk about a bit about Ashley, because I ne- he nearly produced, before I actually did Sandwich Bars, there, there was some talk of... Um, uh, I was going to uh, Ashley was going to produce a show, and then he did. He produced Josh Howie's show that I was in a couple of episodes of. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he, and he um, knows what he's doing. He's very yeah. Good he's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what. He, I mean, we could probably get him on and ask him, but um, he's. I mean, he's. Uh, he, and you did a show with Ashley, and Ashley is yes. a very is a is is, is some kind. I actually never. Um, 
uh, I never actually asked him what kind. Of, what I mean, he's Orthodox Jewish, right? So, yes, he's Orthodox Jewish, and uh, he... I know one of the things I like he's got a big hat. Yeah, he can take his hat off, and he's got like a little emergency <laughs> hat underneath. Yeah, it. emergency hat. <laughs> yeah, he's got his, uh, his, his kippah's couple. He's got he's got that. Yeah, on. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, but he is also because of his religion, and it's kind of diff- it's difficult for him, and it's that he can't shake hand, he can't shake hands with women producers and stuff like that. And he oh to, yeah, he's hard. He's just to say that in advance that he yeah when he's yeah he makes meetings. it very. He, he, I mean, if you can't see it by looking at him, he makes it very clear. Just like look, I can't. Also, when we were on tour, to, so we did a show together called Profit Sharing. Right. right? Yeah. Okay, such it's a, a great, great, great title. It was his idea. What a great, <laughs> what a great title. And we did um, a tour. Um, and it was, you know, nothing like this seemingly had been done before. It, I, I'm pretty sure there are other Muslims and Jews who've done comedy shows, but ours was the best. Like ours was really <laughs> And we did a and a at the end that people really enjoyed. And I remember when we um, when we did that, when we were on tour, after a show, I'd be hungry. So I'd be on Deliveroo. And now almost everything is halal, right? Um, and it's quite easy for me to be able to get uh, to, to get a meal after a show. But for kosher, I discovered it is so much more difficult than halal. Mm. Like it's so much more, uh, you know, a, uh, you have to have the kitchen has to be split into milk and meat. There has to be a rabbi observing the whole uh, process in order for him to sign off on it being kosher. So Ashley, I don't think he had a cooked meal whilst we were on tour. <laughs> like whilst we were That's in the hotel. Like hotel. That, it was like that, mind you, after touring in the 80s was like that. You couldn't get a cooked <laughs> meal, but just it wasn't because it wasn't kosher. It was just because old food. Was horrible. It was a horrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, but, uh, you know, Muslims can eat kosher food, but Jewish people well, can't uh, eat so halal. According to the Quran, right, uh, the food of the Jews and the Christians is lawful to us. Right hmm. now, what that means in the current world, so it's weird. Like halal, effectively, is that this meat has been slaughtered in in the name of God and not to any false idol or attributed to any lesser thing. Right. That's all it is. And so effectively, that's what kosher, it, it's much more stricter in the way that uh, it's prepared. But we are allowed to eat their food because kosher food isn't, when it's slaughtered, they're not invoking the name of a different God. It's the same God the Muslims are talking about. We're just using slightly different language, right? Uh. Um, what the, the food of the Christians is, I don't quite understand. Um, but that's what the Quran says. The, the, the food of the Jews, the Christians is lawful to us. Um, so knowing that, it just kind of makes you know it's uh it made life a bit easier but in here in modern britain I, it's easy for me to get any type of food that i want and it to be halal but for kosher i mean yeah i felt really bad for Ashley. i think he just had like snacks in his bag that he kind of su- survived on um which must have been really really difficult we did we went to a kosher restaurant once at the start i, I think even, no, sorry when i say at the start before we actually did the tour we went out near where he lives, and there's kosher restaurants near him, and we had, that's the only cooked meal I think I've had with him ever, was before the tour started. Uh, would you want to tell us a bit about how you... Came, became a stand-up then as well, what, what that journey was. Yeah, well, um, before, so before <laughs> stand-up. Very NPR of you, yeah. Yeah. I, when I was a, um, when I was a kid, I loved watching Benny Hill. Uh, when I was like five years old, like four, three, four, five years old, I loved watching Benny Hill. But um, I didn't, I didn't know what stand-up was until I was about a teenager. Uh, when I was a teenager, we got cable and they had the Comedy Store TV show and the Jonglers TV show on at midnight. And I was like, wow, what is this? There's, there's like a, a shop that you can go sit in and people get up on stage and they tell jokes and that's their <laughs> job. I'm like, I should be doing that. But my first love was in video games, hence why I've got all that video game paraphernalia behind me. Um, is uh, So I wanted to go make video games. I'll do comedy later. And then eventually I was like, right, I'm going to go for the comedy and start uh, and then just got on, got on the circuit doing open mics. Um, but at the same time, this is a bit, bit of a trip for me to be on a podcast with Alexi Sale because I remember you 
uh, from, from the 80s on comedy TV shows, even though I was too young to understand them. <laughs> and now, little did I know, decades later, I'd be on a podcast talking about serious things and trying to yeah. be funny at the same time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just got on the circuit. And with another way that myself and Alexia connected, not only did I watch you back in the 80s on, on, on television, and even though I was too young to understand what it was all about, um, my... My dream in comedy, like I was like, I had to play the comedy store. I was like, that's where I want to go. That's the best place in the world. That's a co- uh, that's the club I want to play. I did over fourteen open spots at the comedy store before I was given a weekend, and 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 then and then I was in. But uh, I'm even I've even got my comedy store um, mug. No right. tea out of oh, nice. <laughs> the original logo that they stole yeah, from yeah. the United it's, States. Yeah, yeah. So um, absolute. Uh, yeah. So the comedy store was the thing. I was like, I need to be a comedy store comedian. I want to be that caliber of com- uh, comedian. And I did it. Managed to. Uh, so w- w- uh, the highlights of my career have been: I got nominated at the Edinburgh Festival in 2010. I ended up on Michael McIntyre's comedy roadshow. Um, and then I've got to, you know, travel the world telling jokes. But whilst that's been happening, I've also been discovering, you know, I got to talk about things that, that are important to me. And I think I've really learned that from Mark Thomas and uh, and Jeremy Hardy. Um, I was like, there are important things that need to be said and important things that we need to do with our lives. And it's all good and fun ha- making funny jokes and laughing. But if I have the opportunity to speak up, to make the world a better place and say difficult things. I've got to do it. And that's why I really admire, you know, any comedian who, who, who speaks up for justice mm. and commits themselves to it in any shape or form um, is, is someone who's truly living life. You know, th- this isn't, we're not here to thrive, uh, to survive. We're here to thrive. And when, when someone from culture X community or culture X sees the humanity in someone who's from community Y or Z and goes, you deserve to have the same as I have. You deserve to live in the world of peace and have the same privilege as I have. I think that's one of the most beautiful things a human being can do. Um, and especially, we're very well aware, you know, you criticize Israel, you can get into a lot, uh, you know, that you, you can end up in a lot of hot water. And it almost feels that the whole of Israeli culture is this hostile thing. And it's not because there's loads of Israelis doing amazing. I, I discovered, um, I, I, I befriended a lady from JCOR, the Jewish Council of Racial Equality. And what I discovered about them is that they will befriend refugees who come to Britain, whatever their background is, and help them and just go, we know what it feels like to, you know, to be running from pillar to post. And we know what it means to be persecuted and have to escape and end up as you know, foreigners in foreign lands, whatever. So we will help. Those. And, they, and when I met them, they were helping this Eritrean Muslim guy, I believe he was. Um, Eritrean or Ethiopian, I've forgotten now, but it was a few years ago. I remember they met, um, met him and they were just helping him with, you know, get here are the resources available to you to be able to, you know, have a roof over your head, food in your stomach and opportunities for you to access education or whatever you need to help you survive and watch you're enduring this difficult thing. Mm. And so the Jewish community is doing that in Britain. And if we don't know about this, then we're going to end up with this one dimensional image of who Jews and Israelis are. And uh, it really surprised me because I was like, we need we need to know this. I think the broader Muslim community and the Jewish community have to build more bridges together and understand what we're doing. We have to understand, like, how do I know about J Corps? But loads of people, in fact, I bet there's loads of Jewish people who don't know what J Corps is. Probably and definitely not. loads of Muslims don't know what J Corps is. Yeah. And the other countless of Israeli and Jewish organizations that are trying to make society a better place. Um, so there is a great scope for improvement uh, there. Okay, maybe we should. Well, we should then because we're partly going to talk about Jeremy as well. That I think that um, you went to the West Bank with him and you knew him. That Jeremy pulled off that trick that I haven't quite managed to do, which is to be so beloved by Middle England, partly because of his work on um, Radio Four and uh, yeah. the news quiz, I guess. Uh, but he was. I mean, I. I mean, one several things I liked about Jeremy. I think he got better as a comic that he was he, he, towards the end, he, uh, you know, before his, his untimely death, he was really great. I was, did a benefit with him somewhere. And I just thought he was fantastic really, which I hadn't always uh, particularly necessarily liked a lot of what he'd done beforehand, but also he was, he'd go on those 
uh, panel shows and shit like that. And I guess he did. Did he do Question Time as well? And just be so fierce about, you know, partic- I mean, politics in general, particularly Palestinian rights. As you say, you can pay a price for uh, holding those views, but about everything, really. He was so fierce and so immovable. And his death was, um, I mean, just, it was, you know, we really lost somebody, I think, who I say was getting better and was also, was, was so loved by a lot of the British public. Mm. Makes yeah, me I- a bit suspicious. I mean, that you know, there's a point when every single left-wing leader in um, South America got cancer. <laughs> they might have been too paranoid. Well, but I, I mean, it's... I was there at his uh, memorial, and so the memorial that they did at the Battersea Art Centre. Yeah, I was there, yeah. Uh, and then, um, yeah, that that was an amazing. Just how much love yeah. there was for this man from across the entertainment industry and beyond uh, was phenomenal. And um, and then years later, we did the benefit in his name at the Apollo, um, and that was um, I, I got to I I got to do a little speech for Map, and I did a bucket collection at the end with loads of people spilling out the Hammersmith Apollo, and I'm there with a the bucket and the Map team, uh, <laughs> and we collected thousands of pounds. And it's his legacy, the impact that he's left in this world, which made me realise of the kindness that Jeremy put into the world exists within us. And some of the kindness that we show to others is because of the kindness that Jeremy showed us how to give to others as well. And so in a way, you know, your kindness is immortalized. Your example is immortalized in the people who survive you and know your legend. And whenever I just think about anything nice that I've done, or somebody says thank you to me, I just think some to that point when Jeremy was nice to me, when I asked him for help and I asked him, look, I'm writing a radio show. I don't know how to do it. Will you help me? And he sent me the transcript for his entire, the, the, for, for his last series. He goes, this is how I formatted it. This is what I did. You can listen and learn from this. I'm like, wow, he, he gave it to me. Like that was the, the last, I think, email we exchanged was him going, here you go. Here's transcript. Wow. wow. What, what? Who does that? Yeah. No, he was, uh, yeah, he was, um, I mean, he did those things that he was professionally really good, but he was also personally a decent person. That's often, mm. you know, that's um, with most comics, you get one or the other. Certainly do with me. Fuck. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, he was a real. I mean, he was a tremendous example, and and he's a he's a he's an enormous loss. I think really. Uh, do we want to? I mean, how are we doing? I mean, is there any, anything else you want to say, Imran? I mean, uh, thank you for bringing a rare note of positivity to this uh, podcast. Really. Yeah, it's I oh, know really? it's uh, we're not quite used to it. Really, it's 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 endless. It's endless kind of. <laughs> But you know, I think violent, it's violent, violent negativity usually. It's come from my background in video games. So, like, I kind of bounced around the games industry. I was a uh, an assistant producer, then I became a games tester, where I really learned what I was doing. Uh, became a, an assistant producer again. But as a games tester, you're looking for like, right, this is broken. Why is it broken? Like, what, like, what is the infrastructure of its brokenness? And then how do we how do we fix it? And I think human interaction is no different. We think we've got these like. Uh, we're in these uh, th- these are uh, unwin. It's a, it's an unwinnable situation. It's not. This has happened over and over again. There's always been g- groups of people who've been in massive conflict um, that has gone on for ages. But th- but through when the rest of the world, when we can now collectively talk together as a planet and not just as as these as these tribes, go. How do we solve this? Because we want every you know the fact that I I've went to um. I went to the the reform synagogue in Finchley and it was easy. Like I live in a country where I can call up a Jewish person and go, Hey man, I want to come visit your synagogue and learn about what you guys do. And he's like, yeah, cool. My name was on the list. Uh, and I turned up at the synagogue and they welcomed me. They didn't treat me like an outsider at all. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe they looked at me and went, May, uh, I'm, I'm j- another type of Jewish person. Where effectively all Muslims really are because it's all the same God. It's all the same prophet. I think right? with the name of Imran Yusuf, they had a kind of idea. But yeah, I was welcomed in. And then later we went to the Rabbi Laura's house for, uh, um, uh, for, for dinner. And... What's really great wow. about Rabbi Laura is that she's like any, you know, you can ask any question you want and you're in a, in fact, she gave me, I've got a copy of the Tanakh, which is um uh, uh, ancient Jewish scripture uh, on there that she gave to me as well. Because I like to read from every religion. I like to learn and understand, you know, how, uh, 
how any religious person sees the world, what their relig uh, religious tradition has brought them. So, you know, that's a great thing about Britain. Don't forget that. If you don't know something about another group of people, it's very easy to find someone and go, hey, can I come to your cultural center? Can I, can I come to your place of worship and yeah. learn about you? And, you know, the Jewish community has been around a long time and, and they have that facility. We just may not know about it. Yeah. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to be invited to that table because I, I know it's there and I invite other people from whatever background you're from is there is a table around which we can sit around and have very difficult conversations but at least we can sit around it and have those conversations and not be each other's throats. So let's do that. They say people are afraid of the unknown. So just remove the unknown part of it. Well, um, you've raised the moral tone of this podcast by about 12,000%. <laughs> uh, well, um, Alexi, you know, I'm also <laughs> grateful. It's someone who is a prominent, a prominent name in the entertainment world, someone, especially like yourself, who helped give birth to alternative comedy in this country. Absolutely. And Didn't as help. a Jewish, yeah. <laughs> it must be a, but Single also as a Jewish person, for you to say yeah. what you're saying is, it's, it, it's, it's a huge, it's like a looking at a beautiful light that's going, oh my God, there's somebody from that community of people with whom we think we have this one dimensional conflict, but no, it's not. There is plenty of, of uh, love and understanding and acceptance um, within that community. And for you to come forward and say that, Alexi, is it, well, it's a huge you. thing. And thank yeah. you for doing that. And I hope uh, in welcome. the same way that you are an ally to Palestinians, that I hope that I, as a Muslim, can be an ally to the Jewish and Israeli world as well. Beautifully Amazing. put. Yeah. Thank you, Imran. You're, thank you. You've given us a lot to think about. I'm very impressed with this. My podcast, though, two sort of Muslims and a sort of Jew. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. That's sort of. Well, you're, 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 well, you're, you know, you're a problem. <laughs> so, I love that. It's a nice <laughs> title. You ever That's... thought of going on the Hajj or anything? Uh, you're, you've been brought up too secular. Tell our love, really. uh, me. I'm, I'm too yeah. secular. Yeah, I'm. I've very early on a, sh a shunned religion from my life and like from uh, my outlook. It, well, it's not. I. I yeah, I, I think my my dad was very open minded. My mum is religious enough a bit, but my dad is very um, secular. And you speak. I mean, your Arabic is fluent, right? I know I speak I'd fluent speak. Arabic, and I think I've had too many experiences growing up being lectured by family members on my visits to Syria or when they visit us about how I'm living. Uh, devilish lifestyle and you know i'm going down a very dark path and that you should you know sort it out and then that naturally makes me want to reject that shit and then when i the first time someone took i was at after school club in primary school and one of the people who like part-time probably late teenager who like does a does a shift at the after school club just playing football with the kids probably out of um probably broke the rules and, and explained atheism to me and like just broke it down to me. And I was like, that's an option. <laughs> I, I don't have to go to hell. And so I think I kind of was enamored by atheism very, very young. And it's kind of stayed with me. Um, but I do believe there's that you can learn from any, uh, any religion. I think religion and, you know, I don't want to offend anyone who is, has, is faithful out there. I will never, deny anyone anyone's right or uh, to to believe uh, in their in their faith and who am i to say what's right or wrong but oh, it's my job it's one of the conversations my late dad uh would re repeatedly me and him would have is about where religion comes from and it comes from a place of necessity and he would t tell me stories about muhammad um about how he was a real person and you know the reasons for things being so-called outlawed in, in Islam, it was because it was dangerous at the time. Like they don't eat pork and uh, certain seafood because it's they come from a hot climate and that shit goes off really quickly and it's dangerous to eat it and they didn't have fridges. So like that's why that's why uh, there's no, you're not meant to eat pork, but those rules were created then out of necessity mm -hmm. and now we have fridges, but 
they're still it's part of the tenets of Islam. And like no alcohol, he was like, my dad used to love a glass of whiskey every night. And, and he would just, I guess this was him justifying why he liked bacon and, and booze. But <laughs> he, he'd go like, Muhammad had to ban alcohol because people kept showing up to prayer drunk. And he well, told yeah, them the not to come thing. drunk. To yes, pray. That's, that's what the Quran says, and not turn out to pray drunk. So it's weird. The Quran forbids the flesh of swine. Mm -hmm. It forbids usury, right? Um, but in the same language, I don't believe is used for alcohol. It, it advises against turning up. It advises against alcohol, right? Yeah. And advise, and don't turn up to pray drunk. drunk. But yeah. in the way that pork is pork is forbidden. Usury is forbidden. That's made very clear. What's usury? Usury, like, so usury... Loaning money, by extracting interest from money. Oh, yeah. right. or, or the exorbitant interest on a loan. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, weirdly, I think it's forbidden in Christianity and Judaism as well, but, like, in the modern world, it's all gone, been shot to hell, you know? Yes, well, there was very good reasons for bad, banning usury. Yeah. That's why you have the Islamic Bank, because they don't do interest and stuff. Well, apparently they don't do interest. I just think it's all like the, <laughs> the language around it has changed, but the mechanism might be the same. I'm not an expert uh, on that. But interesting what you're saying here, Talal, uh, right, is you have questioned religion, right? And you yeah. should, right? This is getting too far away yeah. from brand <laughs> Alexi now. Yeah. This is this is damaging my brand. What do you think I of Berettas, you, Imran? <laughs> yeah, 9 mil or 7.6. 5.56 assault rifle. Uh, thank you very much, Imran. That, as uh, ever, I think this podcast was um, didn't go at all in the way I was expecting it, but it's mm. been extraordinary. I think it's been amazing. Oh, thank you. It's been an honour. It's really an honour to, uh, <laughs> to be asked to do this. Thank you for having me, and I hope this isn't the last time uh, no, we let's, get, uh, yeah, we get to uh, chat and work together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's great. We want to see you do stand up again, Alexi. Want to see you back on stage? Yeah, well, I'm. Yeah, I'd like to see me back on stage as well. It's a uh, it's a bit complicated, really, because um, I've got no I've got no new material at all. Really, it's also I think I was saying to, like the 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 stand the it was this you know the I was doing this tour which was a you know which was two thirds of the way through it when uh, lockdown struck and so I'd cancel it. And then I used all, it was a beautiful, beautiful show, the 2019, 2020 show that I was doing, which I then used a lot of it on Imaginary Sandwich Bar. So at least it got used, but I didn't get really to do it live more than a few days. But mm. then, you know, but it, it perfectly captured the zeitgeist, I think for me that it was, it was political, but it was about, it was about the hope of the Jeremy years and then how they were betrayed. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, uh, you know, there was a lot of kind of really heartfelt stuff about uh, you know betrayal and uh, political, uh, you know, the machinations of the right and stuff. And so you know, but then um, so that was that show. And, that, and but now now that I'm seventy, that that was what was at the forefront of my mind: hope and then despair. But then you know, but now what's at the forefront of my mind is death and um, illness. I don't know whether you can get stand up out of that. Ready? Can you do a show out with just about all your mates getting ill? Um, yeah, I'm pretty, well, you can do about anything. <laughs> uh, uh, you got uh, any uh, ideas? Or any of the listeners have got any idea about how you can make that funny? But that's uh, that's the reality. Am I left out? Seventy? I'm seventy <laughs> now, and uh, that would I've make a, a great I've got a topic. Blood class at the moment. Your comedy Thanks. should reflect your journey in your life, man. Uh, yeah, but it's not. It's, I was, you can make that that shit funny. Tell funny well, stories we'll about the people who have died to kind of, you know, tell your funny <laughs> stories about their lives, your interactions with them. <laughs> well, we'll see. Reviewing the Lexi Sale 2024. Never has an audience been so stunned into silence by the miserable. <laughs> Shit that Alexis Sale related to. It's a uh, challenge. Getting old is a challenge. Well, we'll be doing I'll more live uh, podcasts. Uh, yes, that's true. For now as well. So. Them. Yeah, live podcasts. Yeah, we're planning that, aren't we? Come along and watch uh, one of those with at us the comedy store, around. hopefully. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would be good. That would be great. That would be amazing. It'd be the yeah. Amazing well, come along. Before. Yeah. The the club that you helped bring into, you know. I birthed it. I was its you midwife. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have existed without me. Dom Ward wouldn't have that house in the south of France if it wasn't for me. <laughs> he does have a nice house. I've, I've stayed at his house. 
Is the one which one? The one in the one in his in, in, in Antibes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, fucking paid for. That should be called Maison de Alexi. <laughs> I fucking paid for that place. Where's my house in the south of France, Don? Uh, he's he's uh he's like you know what I love about Don is that he. He 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 attends his club like he watches what happens at his yeah. club. He watches everyone on stage. He cares about the quality of the comedy that's happening in his club, and that's what's kept the the standard so high for so long. Um, and you know he's always there. He also yeah. like years ago he had a club in India, and that's yes. the first time I went to India was because of the comedy store. Really? So I went back to my I guess my ancestral homeland because the comedy store were like, can you come out here and do comedy? And I can jump between Hindi and English quite easily. I didn't realize that I could wow. uh, on stage. And, and I loved it. We, oh, it was amazing. And then fortunately, you know, the, 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 uh, the club got swindled out from under him and it didn't, uh, you know, it came to an end, but I was really, you know, I was really lucky. I got to play, I've played the comedy store in England and in, uh, and in India when they had it. Um, and it was great. It's just, it's amazing that f- for the two of us who've played the comedy store here, is that you were there. Hey, I did the one in Manchester. Section. Oh, you done the one in Manchester? Yeah. Oh, cool. well, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, that's under repair at the moment. It's under like a long, like a uh, severe repair uh, issues they're dealing with. That's to close it after you did, did it too yeah. long. Yeah, I, I think I left a cigarette <laughs> yeah. lit or something. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you help give birth to a comedy store and the comedy store ultimately would then go on to inspire me to go, I want to play that club more yeah. than any other club. Um, and it really shaped me. I also did the cutting edge at the comedy store. It was their Tuesday topical show. Uh huh. Um, so I, I used to do that and I got around the likes of Ian Stone, Sean Mio, Paul Thorne, Steve Gribbin, Martin Coyote. And that helped me, you know, write short form topical stuff. So it's it's massively shaped me and it's, I, it's this is an odd thing. Oh my god, I'm on a podcast with Alexi Sale. Yeah, and the it's a, and the yeah, habit. yeah. You know, what you did affected me, and hopefully one day, yeah, someone might be inspired by what I'm getting away I'm with. I'm sure. Well, they'll be inspired yeah. by this podcast. <laughs> yeah, There's nothing else. Thank you very much. How'd you say thank you? Hindi is like. Oh, this is going to go on forever. Hindi is Hindi the same as Urdu, basically. You speak um, Hindi rather than very, Urdu. Very, very similar. So yeah. Urdu is written in Arabic. Uh, Hindi yeah. is written in uh, Devanagri, I think it's uh, thing. So weirdly, I think I speak Urdu, but when I go to India and I speak what I think is Urdu, they go, "Oh, your Hindi is very good." And and then when I meet pe- proper Urdu speakers, they're like, "Haha, your Urdu is really funny." So yeah. <laughs> they kind of speak a thing that's in between both of them. But I perfectly understood, and I can get by, um, which I'm quite proud of because I have a connection to my ancestral language. Yeah, I'm also learning Japanese at the moment, and it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Is it? Yes. yes. Like, oh, it's, 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 it started off easy. It's and easier now it's, than I'm, Chinese. I'm really, yeah, I'm it's probably easier than Ch- uh, Chinese. Yeah. But I'm just, I, I've been doing it for about a year, and I'm not conversational. I can say, you know, I can say yeah. more than I could say a year ago. But um, yeah, I'm on my third language at the moment, and um, it's 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 a lot more difficult than I thought. Yeah. It would be. See, what other podcast do they have? An Arabic speaker, Hindi <laughs> speaker, <laughs> me. Where do I blast Espanol, más o menos? <laughs> me, fucking Josh Widdicom. You haven't got any of this, <laughs> you fucker. <laughs> just to bring back a bit of negativity, just to restore the. I had, I, had one, I have one question I really wanted to ask Imran. Go on then. We go. Yalla. Because I was really fascinated by you bringing up the 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 games testing and that like gamifying life. Yeah. Because like, like it's become like normal to use gamified language, like Boris Johnson saying leveling up all the time, and now that's right, normal right. and shit. So like life has become gamified, and like people don't even realize it. And they talk about it in education, and it's such a great way to like help people improve and like solve problems, like you were saying. That's what it is. So All maybe... video games really are are massive puzzles. Yeah. yeah. So, it uh... looks like you're just shooting zombies, but really it's a puzzle. Like you're in a situation with a set amount of tools and there is a challenge in front of you. How do you solve it? And we think, oh, I'm just shooting zombies. You know, you're just being mindful of like how much ammunition have I got? What kind of weapons have I got? What kind of zombies are these? What kind of tactics can I use to get around them? It, you know, if I do, I have to confront them. And in life, really, life is very much like a game of here's the situation that I'm in. How can I overcome it? How can I beat it? Yeah. What, what tools do I have? What options do I have? What what options or tools do I not know that I have or that I can get as mm-hmm. well? And I think when you apply that kind of 
that attitude and thinking to life, you realize uh, there's this beautiful quote from Steve Jobs, which I'm not going to do any justice to. He goes, there's a, you know, you're told that life is this, you're in this box and don't bash into the walls too much. But really life is quite malleable and that, you know, when you poke something here, something has to come out the other end and everything that you see in the world has been made by people no more intelligent than you, that the life and the world is malleable and we can make it. And if we want, so particularly, uh, specifically to this podcast, we can have peace between Israel and Palestine. This is what I want to ask. We can you. make the world, you know, in the image of this, to be better than it is now, right? There was a time where in this country, you couldn't move between part you know you couldn't you couldn't just go move between england oh sorry like london and manchester and and edinburgh and 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 glasgow just like that now you can you can just get on a plane and go there and live there and and start a life there and ultimately we will see that with the world and we're part of that having this conversation in the future there'll be conversations like did you know there's this uh there's this jewish comedian lexi sell and this muslim comedian imran yusuf and they, they used to talk and they used to talk about peace and how they can help each other and what they can do and the world that they will live in will be built upon the kind of conversations we're having now and the efforts we're making now and i feel really heartwarmed that that's what i get to be part of and that after i leave this world and whatever happens next I, perhaps some joy there'll be joy in this world that we've all participated in making happen even though we won't be around to see it uh, thank you Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and end on that positive note i'm just going to say i want to say something negative just to uh, resist alexi resist resist, res, resist res, restore the ph balance <laughs> here's Dharma's a fucking shit bag yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go You've been listening to the Alexi Sale Podcast. Produced and edited by Talal Karkuti. Music by Tarboosh Records. And please support us. I'm 70 now and I'm using my pension to pay for this podcast. So please send us some money at patreon.com forward slash Alexi Sale Podcast. Because I'm using my money that I've not, you know, the cat's having to eat scraps. Wilf's not getting the highest quality of uh, cat food because I'm paying for my podcast. <laughs> Out of my pension. Oh, poor Wilf. And what do they get if they visit that page? They can subscribe for any amount of money on there, by the way. But what kind of uh shit do they get out of it? Oh, the Patreon. What do we get? What do they get? What Talal, you're asking me. What do they get out of the Patreon yeah. if they subscribe? Well, they can sub they can pay any kind of money, and they get to see amazing, exclusive stuff that they wouldn't be able to see otherwise. They can see me and Nigel Planer and Lisa Mayer watching a cup, uh, an edition of the Young Ones, and commenting on it. They can see Alexi and Talal and uh, his brother at the uh, gun range, firing all manner of weapons. <laughs> we haven't done put that up yet. Soon, <laughs> when, when you've edited that. They can see what's the other thing we've done. Oh, the live, the live podcast, shows. the live shows. They can see them. Fucking oh, that's worth that's worth five pound a month of anybody's money. I think mm -hmm. we'll take yeah. Patreon dot com forward slash Alexis Sale Podcast, please. You know, I often listen to Six Music, and they have the people emailing saying. They always seem to be making like a vegetable lasagna. They say, hi, Lauren, making a vegetable lasagna and listening to six music. Love the show. I think Lauren doesn't give a fuck about your vegetable. She has to pretend to be interested in it. In, 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 in. They're often like smoking meat or building a fucking canoe. Hi, Lauren. Uh, building a canoe. Uh, listening to six music. Love the show. Or... There was a weird one the other day, waiting for our, just making cocktails and waiting for our amazing new neighbours to come round. I thought, oh, that's a bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, that sounds a bit, oh, I don't like the sound of that. Waiting for our, listening to Six Music, making cocktails, waiting for our amazing new neighbours to come round. Love the show, Craig. You know, keep on playing. And, uh, yeah, Craig doesn't. I think Craig's vaguely repelled by your excitement and your new neighbours coming around for cocktails. I, on the other hand, I want to hear what you've got to say. I want your emails. I want your fan art. 
I'm genuinely interested because it's about me. It's about me and it's about you. And, um, you know, I'm not, in, I mean, I don't think I'm interested if you're making veggie, but you, you braise in some aubergines. I don't, I don't know if I'm in, I might be. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we got a nice email by Liam about guns, by the way. I'm going to pass oh, yeah. that on to you. Yeah. yeah. About the politics and guns. And he sent a book recommendation. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks for that, Liam. Thank you, um, Liam. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. I'm going to the doctors now. Come on, Alexi. This way. This way. Me prescription. Oh, oh yes. Oh, a bit unsteady. I want to fall. Yeah, we'll get oh. your prescription. Don't worry. Oh, Come on. Shit. I've got it's a through here. urinary tract infection. I'm seeing things. No, no, that was cleared up last month. Remember, <laughs> that's all gone. Why am, why am I still seeing things? I don't understand. Was it? Why am I, am I having visions? Those are called dreams, Alexi. Remember, you, you, oh. you talked about it over coffee this morning. <laughs> Come on to the doctors. They're waiting for us. Oh, oh, oh they got a taxi. <laughs> no. I've got a car, I've got, remember? I've got a car, alright. Oh, come on. <laughs> Use your oh, freedom pass if you like. Oh, I'm frightened. Oh, the outside world is all. Oh. Ah, what was that? I don't know. Was that, did that happen here? Yeah. Was it I here? Know. I think it was you, wasn't it? I think that was you. Was it? Oh, that's spooky. What's going on? No, it's a shit. That wasn't oh, here. Oh, it's a poltergeist.